We know that obesity in general is associated with higher rates of certain types of cancer. In fact, 13 specific cancers, and I'll get into that in a little bit. By now, you probably have heard of these new miracle drugs, especially these weight loss drugs known as GLP-1 RA, GLP-1 receptor agonist. So talking about Ozempic, which is also known as semaglutide, and when it's in the higher dose, it's known as Wegovy. And then we have terzepatide, which is known as Manjaro. And this is actually not only a GLP-1 receptor agonist, but it's also a GIP agonist. These drugs were actually first developed for type 2 diabetes. And what many people don't realize is that obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, dyslipidemia with high LDL and high triglyceride levels, fatty liver disease, well, they're all part of the same problem in that they all develop as a result of insulin resistance. Okay, so insulin resistance, what is it? It refers to when the cells in your body, especially cells in your muscles, fat, brain, liver, they start responding poorly to a specific hormone that circulates in your bloodstream called insulin. And this is a huge problem because it disrupts your body's homeostasis. It's to say that it messes with your body's physiology. It's messing with your body's hormones, energy balance, cravings, emotions. Basically, it messes you up in every way imaginable. So here's a hard hitting fact is that every chronic non-communicable disease is either caused by or made worse by insulin resistance. So 80% of diseases are chronic non-communicable diseases, which is to say that we're not talking about things that are purely genetic, like family polyposis coli, where it's an autosomal dominant condition, where it's a genetic condition where people are going to get colon cancer by the time they reach their 40s, purely genetic. Okay, then we have infectious diseases. Okay, that's a communicable disease. So 80% of disease is non-communicable, which is to say that it's of metabolic origin, which is to say that it's of an origin of insulin resistance. So we're talking about things like heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, even fatty liver disease, type two diabetes, hypertension, all of these things are a result of insulin resistance. How do you diagnose metabolic syndrome? Well, you need to meet three out of these five criteria. One of those criteria is central or abdominal obesity. So that's where you're measuring waist circumference. In men, it's greater than 40 inches. In women, it's greater than 35 inches. Okay, so that's one. Uh, the other one is high triglycerides. So a level that's 150 or higher. Um, or if you're taking a medication that's actually treating high triglycerides. So we'll just say 150 there. Then it's having a low HDL cholesterol. So HDL cholesterol is known as a good cholesterol or if you're taking a medication for uh, your cholesterol. So men, it's an HDL level less than 40, and women, HDL less than 50. The fourth criteria is high blood pressure. So having a blood pressure that's more than 130 systolic or 85 diastolic, um, or if you're taking medication for high blood pressure. And the fifth criteria is having a high fasting glucose or high fasting blood sugar specifically 100 mg per DL. So if it's higher than that, or if you're taking a medication used to treat that, such as metformin or insulin or glipizide, that would count. So that would meet that criteria. So if you have three out of these five, that's a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. You could think of insulin resistance as a spectrum of disease. On one end of the spectrum is zero insulin resistance, where people are super healthy. Then some people have a small degree of insulin resistance. And then if you get a little more insulin resistance, you're now in the pre-diabetes range. And then there's type two diabetes. And then finally, the highest level of insulin resistance being insulin dependent type two diabetes. The bottom line is the more insulin resistance you have, the less healthy you are, and the higher your risk of things like heart attack, stroke, dementia, fatty liver disease, cancer, depression, in other diseases as well. And if you wanna know how insulin resistant you are, which is to say, if you wanna know how healthy you are from a metabolic standpoint, it's best to use the HOMA IR score, which is homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance. So the score is determined based on this formula right here. It's fasting insulin level 
times your fasting glucose level divided by 22.5. Now just know that depending on the lab that you're using, the fasting glucose level can be given in different units. So sometimes it's given in milligrams per DL. And if that's the case, you'll have to convert that in order to use this formula here. Now, maybe you're looking at your previous blood work and notice that you probably don't have a fasting insulin level. That's because most doctors, most labs, they're not checking this unless you're specifically looking for this. So it's something that you're probably gonna have to request from your doctor in order to calculate your HOMA IR score. The lower the score, the better, but generally speaking, you have optimal insulin sensitivity if your score is less than one. Levels above 1.9 indicate early insulin resistance, while levels above 2.9 indicate significant insulin resistance. So if someone is overweight or obese, does that mean that they automatically have insulin resistance? Well, most likely as 90% of people with obesity have some degree of insulin resistance. Only 10% of people with obesity are metabolically healthy, and the term for this is called MHO, metabolically healthy obesity. So maybe you're wondering why 90% of people who are obese have insulin resistance, but the other 10% don't have insulin resistance. Well, it's because their genetics, and more importantly, their epigenetics, made them more prone to secreting more insulin from their pancreas. This is called hyperinsulin secretion, meaning their pancreas is producing way more insulin compared to most other people. Now, if your pancreas is producing more insulin due to hypersecretion, well, that means you're gonna have to eat more. Otherwise, you're gonna suffer the consequences of low blood sugar, AKA hypoglycemia. So this is actually what drives the obesity in those who have metabolically healthy obesity. What we don't know yet is if the cancer risk in those with obesity-related cancers is the same between those with metabolically healthy obesity and everyone else with obesity. It's estimated that more than 90% of cancer is due to environmental factors and less than 10% is due to genetics. When looking at environmental factors, it's been estimated that about 19% of cancers are due to cigarette smoking. About 8% is due to excess body weight. But we also know that generally speaking, there's a lot of other things that go along with obesity, like low vegetable intake, low fiber intake, excess refined carbohydrates and sugar, and lack of exercise. Of course, cigarette smoking is the most common preventable cause of cancer, but obesity is actually not far behind. In the early 1960s, the obesity rate was 13%. Now it's actually at 42%. And that doesn't even include the 20% of children who are obese. And the rise of these numbers has essentially ran parallel to that of type two diabetes, as well as hypertension, as well as fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome. So it just goes to show that all these things are part of the same problem and that's they all stem from insulin resistance. Heart disease is the number one killer, around 700,000 Americans every year, but 600,000 Americans are dying every year of cancer. So it's not that far behind heart disease. And most people know that obesity leads to heart disease, but I don't think a lot of people recognize that obesity is actually a major driver of cancer. The thing about fat is it's not just this flubber stuff that hangs from your body. It's actually very active from a metabolic standpoint and from a hormonal standpoint, and from an immunological standpoint. And this is why excess fat makes our body more prone to developing multiple types of cancer. So reducing the body fat mass can have major benefits for reducing cancer risk, much like when a smoker quits smoking, they reduce their risk for cancer, especially lung cancer. Most people know that in obesity, the fat cells enlarge and the adipose tissue expands, but what most people don't know is that when this happens, the more fat tissue ends up creating more production of something called cytokines. So cytokines are part of your immune system and you need them, but cytokines are bad when you make too much of them, as this leads to all kinds of havoc at the microscopic level, including inflammation, oxidative stress, and ultimately creating a micro environment for your cells that make them more likely to incur genetic mutations leading to the development into cancer. And so it's no coincidence that the 13 specific types of obesity related cancers, they're related to hormones and cytokines that are closely linked with obesity. For example, cancers of the gastrointestinal tract and cancer of sex hormone sensitive tissues. Breast cancer, especially postmenopausal breast cancer, is the cancer that is actually most closely associated with obesity. And there are other obesity-related cancers that are associated with sex hormones, such as ovarian cancer, 
and uterine cancer. And then pretty much all of the organs of the gastrointestinal tract make up to other obesity-related cancers. So things like colorectal cancer, esophageal cancer, gallbladder cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, and stomach cancer. And then the four remaining obesity-related cancers are kidney cancer, multiple myeloma, thyroid cancer, and brain cancer, specifically meningioma. And what's the obesity-related cancer that we keep hearing in the news that is occurring more frequently in younger and younger people? Yeah, that's colon cancer. So obesity is a disease that needs to be treated for multiple reasons, including the need to reduce the cancer risk. There was a large study that got published last year where researchers looked at 30,000 people with obesity, and they then took a look over the course of 10 years the cancer incidence among those who did and those who did not lose weight. The group that lost weight lost about 50 pounds and kept it off, and they did it by means of bariatric surgery. The group that lost weight lowered their risk of cancer incidence by 32%, and they also lowered their risk of dying from cancer by 43%. So that's a huge risk reduction, lowering the risk of dying from cancer by almost half by getting the body weight under control. So we really wanna treat obesity aggressively for multiple reasons, but especially if we wanna make a significant reduction in the cancer risk. There haven't been any studies yet that have specifically looked at Ozempic preventing or reducing the risk of developing cancer, but it stands to reason that if Ozempic and related GLP-1 medications like Manjaro or Trizepatide, if these medications improve insulin resistance and cause people to lose weight, well, it makes sense that they indirectly reduce the risk of obesity-related cancers. So how do these GLP-1 medications decrease insulin resistance and cause people to lose significant amounts of weight? Well, they mimic our GLP-1 hormone, and in the case of Manjaro, mimic our hormone called GIP. Now, GIP tells the stomach to slow down the movement of food there, and this is called delayed gastric emptying. And this is one way the medication keeps you feeling full for longer periods of time. GLP-1 also tells the hypothalamus part of your brain that you're full. That's where your appetite control center is. So these are two very specific reasons as to why you end up eating less with these medications. But then a third reason, if we're talking about Manjaro, Terzepatide, is that it mimics GIP, which is to say that it directly tells your fat tissue to start burning fat. So it's not just weight loss and improving type 2 diabetes with these medications. It's improving everything that goes along with having insulin resistance. In fact, multiple studies have shown that semaglutide, interzepatide, they lower triglycerides, they lower LDL cholesterol, they increase the HDL cholesterol, they improve fatty liver disease, they even improve or lower blood pressure. And one of the things that gets overlooked in these studies is that they actually reduce CRP levels meaning they reduce inflammation in the body. And we know that inflammation is what drives heart attacks. It also drives strokes and it also drives cancer, especially the obesity related cancer. So if you're someone who's looking to improve your health, including reducing your risk of cancer, it always starts by eating healthy food, meaning unprocessed food that's full of soluble and insoluble fiber, and it keeps the added sugar to a minimum. Of course, it entails physical activity or exercise, and intermittent fasting also has a lot of health benefits too, including reducing cancer risk. But it stands to reason that aggressively treating obesity with Ozempic or Manjaro will have a significant effect on preventing or at least reducing the risk of developing obesity-related cancers. That's gonna be all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. And if you wanna be notified of when my next video comes out, hit that bell notification and I'll see you in the next one.